Welcome to Eastern State Penitentiary's Searchlight. I'm Sean Kelly. On behalf of our CEO, Sally Elk, and our entire wonderful staff, welcome. I really am here live at Eastern State Penitentiary for our weekly Searchlight. Uh, if you don't know Eastern State, we are a prison museum in Philadelphia uh, with a long and, and complicated history. Today, we give uh, tours of the building. We interpret the legacy of American justice reform through the nation's, from the nation's founding through today in our cell blocks. We also host art installations. This is an installation by Jesse Crimes, a mural that he completed while incarcerated in federal prison. This is our big graph showing the truly historic nature of the mass incarceration phenomenon of the last 40 years. It's a signature piece of our tour program with a companion exhibit called Prisons Today, Questions in the Age of Mass Incarceration. We are proud second chance employers. Uh, we seek out people with the experience of incarceration uh, for our education team. We find that um, if they choose to share those experiences, it's a tool that is very helpful um, in connecting our visitors to a very complex set of policies. Uh, our most recent project was called Hidden Lives Illuminated. We spent a year teaching animation to people in prisons. Um, this is Kwashim working on his his film that was about the experience of being very ill while incarcerated. It's a piece we've been thinking about a lot lately. We projected those films on the front wall of Eastern State Penitentiary for a month last summer. We are of course closed like all other museums in the United States, um, but while we are closed, we are, are actively connecting with our audiences in a whole series of ways. We have a three minute news roundup on prisons and the pandemic that comes out twice a week. We have a program called the Hospital Tour, Health and Incarceration, which goes out live at 2.30 on Wednesdays. We are highlighting those Hidden Lives Illuminated films, one a week that come out on Thursdays. And next week on Searchlight, we have a program, Life Beyond the Lockdown, formerly incarcerated women share stories of resilience as blueprints for surviving isolation. This is with our friends from the People's Paper Co-op. That's one week from tonight, 6 p.m. next Tuesday night. So uh, you can find all of our programming on our social media platforms like everywhere else. Uh, if you like what we do, we hope you'll join as a member or many other ways you could support us on our webpage, please check it out. Tonight we have a wonderful panel of true thought leaders in the field. The topic is COVID-19's impact on incarcerated youth. I'm gonna turn it over to Liz Ryan from the Youth First Initiative. She put together this panel. I'm gonna be pretty quiet and sit in the back and uh, let Liz run the conversation here for the next little while. Liz, welcome to Searchlight from Eastern State Penitentiary. Thank you for being here. Sean, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to highlight what's happening in youth justice. Uh, tonight, we're gonna hear from a panel of experts about the youth justice system, about how COVID-19 is impacting young people in the justice system and what needs to be done to protect young people during this crisis. Uh, so we have a, a terrific panel lined up tonight. Uh, Vincent Chiraldi, who is the co-director of Columbia's Justice Lab and also co-chair of Youth Correctional Leaders for Justice. We have Ritha Onatiri, who is the director of community engagement at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice and spearheads their 150 Years is Enough campaign. And we have Hernan Carvente Martinez, who is the National Youth Partnership Strategist for the Youth First Initiative. So welcome to tonight's conversation. Uh, so to ground our conversation, I'd like to start with some of the key facts about the youth justice system and youth incarceration. Um, Vinny, can you give us a little snapshot of the youth justice system and youth incarceration today? Yeah, um, it's an interesting uh, time for the field. Uh, there, was a, there was a period of time uh, several decades ago where we call it the super predator era where uh, politicians and pundits on the left and right were vilifying kids as public enemy number one. Uh, the number of kids locked up in uh, juvenile youth prisons uh, exceeded 100,000, which is unheard of by uh, international norms. Um, the number of kids in adult prisons exceeded 12,000. 250,000 kids were being tried as adults. It was a bloody mess. And uh, mm -hmm. a lot of people uh, fought that. And I, I, I don't use the, the, the pendulum uh, terms because like pendulums swing back and forth by gravity. That's not the way social movements move. People jump on the pendulums and pull them at great risk to themselves. And that's what happened mm -hmm. here. Advocates, parents, formerly incarcerated kids themselves, 
fought the fight uh, and some, some I think, open-minded uh, appointed and elected officials. And the numbers have gone down more than half now. It's been a 59% decline since its peak from 1997 to 2017. Number of kids in juveniles, in adult prisons and jails has dropped by 70%. And the important thing is, you know, the, the people who were cheerleaders for locking kids up in the 90s said that if we don't do this, it's going to be a bloodbath. The exact opposite has happened as we've cut juvenile incarceration as we've cut incarceration for kids in adult facilities, crime has plummeted down 71% since 1997, when we were locking up more than twice as many kids. So it, there's still way too many kids locked up in America. We still have the highest juvenile incarceration rate in the world. Conditions inside our youth prisons are awful. Nobody would want their own child to ever go to one of these places and we need to close them. We, we really need to close them because we need to get the resources out of them. It's not uncommon for it to cost a quarter million dollars a year to put a kid in one of these hell holes. Outcomes are terrible and they're wildly racially disparate. So I, I, I wanna excuse myself if I was giving too much good news. There's still plenty of bad news left and there's still plenty of reasons to fight, but uh, it's more equivocal news than it is for people who push adult prison issues. And I know a lot of folks are watching this uh, people who are pushing those issues uh, would, would wish that there were half as many people locked up and that there was at least some amount of facility closures. Two thirds of the big facilities have closed. That there was at least some realignment of money from the prisons to communities. Mm -hmm. There has been for juveniles. It's a long way to go, but we've come a long way. Thank you, Vinny. Thank you for that snapshot and for the, uh, the timeline um, in the past. Uh, couple decades. So, uh, Reetha, I want to turn to you. Old, Liz. That's <laughs> about being, we live through a world, so. <laughs> Well, it's helpful to have that background. It's really, because it, that, that, that centers where we are today. Uh, so I want to turn to Reetha. I'd love to hear what's happening in New Jersey, in particular, where you are, and how does New Jersey compare with some of the other states on this issue? Sure. sure. So uh, thank you so much, Liz. And I'm uh, really pretty uh, happy to be on today. And so in New Jersey, we actually have three youth prisons, uh, two boys youth prisons. Uh, one is Jamesburg, and one is the juvenile medium secure facility, and one girls youth prison. Um, our oldest youth prison is uh, Jamesburg, which was opened 150 years ago, actually. Um, wow. In total, we have about 311 young people in youth prisons. Um, uh, similar to what Vinny mentioned, uh, we cut over the last 10 to 15 years, probably about 70% um, of the young people who are in youth prisons. However, um, there's still, a, of course, too many. Um, about three years ago, uh, on um, June 28th, uh, 2018, we kicked off a campaign to close our youth prisons. And uh, about six months after that, uh, Governor Chris Christie announced the closure of three of our two, two youth prisons. I'm sorry, two of our three youth prisons. So we're pretty happy about that. Governor um, Murphy signed a, uh, a um, executive order um, creating a task force so that we can actually talk about how we and work through how we can close those youth prisons. Um, let me also mention that uh, unfortunately, um, we have huge racial disparities in the, uh, in the state. Um, a young person is 21 times more likely to, a, a black child is 21 times more likely to be incarcerated and arrested than, a, than their white counterpart, even though they commit some of the same um, offenses. So. New Jersey has the worst in the nation, unfortunately. And we're also spending uh, taxpayers' money, um, unfortunately, phenomenally. And so it actually costs about $300,000 per year to um, incarcerate one youth. And uh, unfortunately, our, you know, our youth prisons are uh, half full. So we are uh, spending phenomenal amount of money on, uh, on incarcerating young people 
uh, in the state of, of New Jersey. Um, prior to um, the um, COVID pandemic, uh, the task force was working on um, their final um, report back to the governor that was put on hold, um, but there are a number of recommendations that we're going to be making uh, to uh, the governor in terms of closing these youth prisons. A major thing that I wanted to mention is one of the things that we're pushing in New Jersey is to not create additional uh, youth prisons um, or not, not to construct uh, additional youth prisons. Um, what we're really calling for is to um, close the two youth prisons. Uh, if we need to do anything, we would need to uh, look at repurposing um, something in the community versus um, um, constructing new uh, youth prisons in, in the community. And I, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we are um, really calling for a big investment in community uh, programming. Um, I mentioned uh, that we are spending three, I mean, um, three hundred thousand dollars per year for um, young people to be incarcerated, um, but we're only spending about sixteen thousand uh, dollars in community programming, and so there needs to be a big investment uh, in in a community-based system of care in New Jersey. Thank you, Rita. Thank you for that snapshot. And um, can you just mention briefly the legislation? Uh, that you all have been advocating for around the Absolutely. Yes. So um, uh, in addition to the task force, we work with legislators uh, to put forth the uh, New Jersey Youth Justice Transformation Act that was introduced last year in May. Um, and uh, we reintroduced it again this year in January. And in that legislation, there is recommendations on how to manage the um, disclosure of the youth prisons. And we're also asking for, um, this is again, before COVID-19, $100 million in investing in community-based programming uh, in communities where young people are from. Thank you, Rita. Thanks for that snapshot of New Jersey. Um, so I'd like to turn it to Hernan Carvente Martinez. Hernan, can you talk a little bit about the youth justice system from your perspective? What do you want tonight's viewers to know about youth justice? Yeah, so thank you, Liz, and thank you for everyone else on this panel. I think part of what I want people to understand is that the experience that young people are going through in facilities around the country uh, compares nothing to the isolation or some of the other things that people are experiencing out here, right? If you can think about yourself being at home and being in the sort of comfort of your own bed or being able to go to the kitchen and, and you know, get food whenever you want, or even just step outside, even though you might not be able to go around people, um, you have the luxury of being able to do all of these things or even being able to go purchase the cleaning supplies that might be required in order for you to keep, you know, the spaces that you're in sanitized and, and free of COVID-19. But that's not a luxury that young people currently have around the country, right? And so young people um, at this time are in a heightened state of panic and insecurity and fear. Um, they don't know what's happening. Oftentimes, uh, more often than not, and most of the facilities around the country, what we've heard is young people sort of being kept in the dark about what is happening around COVID-19, about the state's response, um, what, whether or not staff um, are being tested or not tested for it. Um, and the reality is, is that staff are coming in and out of these facilities um, because someone has to come in and caretake for these young people, right? So there is no safe way of preventing uh, the virus from coming in if you, unless you want to keep young people alone in a facility with no supervision and no support. And so it's, it's very intentional on our part to be asking uh, very directly for governors and other state elected officials to release as many young people as we can right now. And it's under the premise that, you know, we, if we want to truly support the well-being of young people, that we need to make sure that they are free um, with their families, with the adequate supports. And obviously, you know, to, to Risa and, and Vinny, who talked a little bit about the, the background, right, that we invest so many dollars into keeping young people locked up in these facilities. And now that we're having to think about what do we do in the middle of a crisis to get as many of them out, uh, people are struggling, right? People are struggling to think about what is the alternative now? Can we release some young people on, uh, on some form of electronic monitoring? Can we release others just because they shouldn't even be in the justice system to begin with, right? Some of them at this time are in there for uh, 
crimes that ultimately haven't even been tried yet. They're still in the trial phase and they're still going back and forth to court. And why do they sit in a juvenile detention when they can be at home with their families and essentially be afforded uh, a multitude of different options to be able to be uh, monitored in the community? And even for those that are currently incarcerated, right? I spent four years incarcerated at Brooklyn Secure Center here in New York State. Um, and I can still tell you, Liz, that my, you know, remembering the time of incarceration that I was in, there's no way for you to keep me safe in a space where I'm constantly, again, being held against my will. And then you're telling me I need to practice social distancing. Well, there isn't a lot of space to be going around practicing social distancing. And also, if you cut off family visitation, you cut off education, you cut off any vocational programming or any recreational activities that I would have had to do every day to just cope and get by uh, on each given day. You remove all of that and you tell me nothing and you lock me in my cell, you can expect, you know, that something is going to go wrong or you can expect that a mental, the mental health of a young person is going to go downhill. So I can go on and on this for like the number of things that are happening to young people and I can only imagine, right? Like I was incarcerated during uh, Hurricane Irene in, in New York and mm. ultimately, um, you know, my experience with that was one of listening to the news and stuff just saying everything is going to be okay everything's going to be okay don't worry about it but when the water started turning brown in the facility and that's all you could drink when you know people started talking about mass evacuation and uh, all the destructive power that this hurricane was going to bring and i was sitting in a cell just like there and couldn't go anywhere that was scary and and so i can't imagine what young people are feeling around the country so i it's i implore everybody who's tuning in right now to really consider that and to consider ways um, to be able to get involved in our efforts to get as many young people out, which I'm sure we will go over in, in a little bit. Hernan, um, just to follow up on a couple of things that you said, and, and uh, you recently uh, wrote a piece called Covering Youth Justice for Reporters about how to cover the issue. Um, can you just talk a little bit about the use of language? You know, so like what you were saying about um, isolation or when people say they're in prison when they're at home, like, could you just talk a little bit about that use of language and what your perspective is on that? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I even woke up this morning, Liz, and, and just like bluntly shared on social media for those that tuned in and, and are familiar with my work, um, where I've, I've bluntly said that, you know, we need to refrain from comparing this experience to what, you know, that social distancing is nothing like solitary confinement. Uh, that being at home within the comfort of everything you have is not being in prison, um, that that is literally you being at home in the time of a crisis. That's what you should be labeling it, labeling it. that's what you should be calling it. And as it relates to these issues, um, broadly speaking, you know, uh, and, and maybe this is for more reporters and also the, the public at large, you know, we need to be careful about um, labeling people as prisoners or convicts or felons who are currently incarcerated or just the demonizing language that we put out there. Um, that language doesn't uh, really help uh, in, in one, humanizing the people that are inside because at the end of the day, these are people. I was a person when I was at Brooklyn Secure. I wasn't just an inmate or a juvenile prisoner, right? I was someone who ultimately had a mother who had a daughter and who had siblings and I was somebody's son um, and somebody's father. And so as we continue to think about how we talk about these issues, we need to actively refrain from using language that one, demonizes our people inside, that two, actively paints a very negative picture of everybody who we have inside. We don't have a bunch of violent people who if you let them loose on the streets, they're gonna you know, ravish your homes and, and you know, take your children. That's not what the only people we have inside. And majority of the people act violently only because the environment breeds that violence, right? It's not the person necessarily that's doing that. So. Um, the Covering Youth Justice report really just talks about very specifically for reporters to, uh, to be mindful of the humanizing, uh, of humanizing people as opposed to demonizing them, uh, really listening to communities and young people for the solutions, right? We uh, might be here as experts. I, you know, I might be considered one on this uh, panel, but ultimately there are multiple experts out there and most of them are young people and families who are currently experiencing COVID-19 firsthand. Thank you, Hernan. That's that's really helpful context. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the scope of the crisis and what's happening with COVID-19 and incarcerated young people. We have a report from the Sentencing Project from Josh Rovner that says today that there are 111 young people 
uh, behind bars who have COVID-19 in juvenile justice facilities, and this is across 14 states, and that there are 199 staff in youth correctional and detention facilities uh, in the juvenile justice system that also have COVID-19. So I wanna, I wanna ask you, Vinny, a little bit about um, what, your, what your sense is of this. Is this, um, does this understate the issue? Do you think there are more cases out there? Um, do you think there's testing happening? What do you think is happening in these facilities right now to ensure that um, young people are protected? And, and also understanding what the scope of the problem is. Yeah, uh, it's almost certainly under testing, right? Poor people never get the same kind of medical care as middle class or rich people do, and poor people who are incarcerated get the worst of the worst. But even, even more than that, I guess I want to encourage us to not take a very individualistic approach to this. Mm -hmm. We need to take a public health approach to this. And, and the way I define that, I spoke to the... Uh, doctor at, at uh, I've been speaking to a lot of correctional administrators and doctors and public health officials, one of whom is a, is a doctor at Rikers Island, Rachel Bedard, who's wrote this really moving op-ed op piece in the Washington Post, if folks haven't seen it. And Rachel said one of the, one of the uh, um, strategic mistakes they made initially was to focus in on individuals' risk of becoming sick and individuals' risk of getting rearrested when they got out, right? And that played very much into the hands of the justice system, which wants to do this one case at a time. Mm -hmm. This is not just about, a public health approach is not just about you or me being sick. It's about what's gonna happen when the virus shows up in our facility. And a bunch of things are gonna happen then. We're gonna cancel visitation if we haven't already. Many of the things are non just mentioned. We're gonna cancel programs, school's gonna go away, uh, volunteers won't be allowed in. Everybody's gonna get nervous as hell because nobody trusts each other. The kids are not gonna trust that the staff's gonna take care of them in most places. And mostly the staff is not gonna trust the kids that they're gonna do the right thing either. Staff is gonna start getting sick and their families are gonna start getting sick and they're gonna worry about getting sick. So even if they're not sick, people will call in sick because they don't wanna get sick. And so when all of that swirls, all of that emotional and psychological stuff, the lack of programming, lack of visitation, and, and uh, a thinning staff complement, both in terms of the correctional officers and the health professionals, then you're in the middle of a storm. Right now, we should be thinking about this the way you think when you see those hurricanes coming towards the Florida coast. We know it's coming. We need to take out the plywood and the hammer and the nails and start boarding up the windows now, not wait till it gets here to take out the plywood. So if you're someplace right now that doesn't have the virus in your youth correctional facility and you're an elected official or you're a correctional administrator, board up the windows now. Don't yeah. start looking at kids one at a time. Start saying things like, nobody comes into this place unless they're coming in for something very serious. Nobody's coming in for a misdemeanor. Nobody's coming in because they cut school or smoked dope or missed appointments with their probation officers which by the way, these places are full of, right? Around the country, none of that. We're not doing any of that. And, and anybody who's in for that stuff, get out. You're close to your, the end of your sentence, get out. Nothing's gonna happen in the next 90 days that's gonna make you a better person in this correctional facility, go home. And so categories of people have to move out so that there's enough room so that when the, when the virus does hit, we have enough staff, we have enough medical staff, we have enough equipment, there's enough space to separate people. And so once you get categories of folks out, then you should be very carefully planning for individual kids to leave as well. You shouldn't just stop. That's when you should look at the kids who's got asthma, you know, real individualistic plans where the prosecutors and the defense attorneys and the judges are talking about them and, and making individual decisions. But first, before you spend time doing all that stuff, get big numbers of young people out of those facilities because once the storm hits, it's too late for that. Then people are sick and then you're gonna have to worry whether you're infecting the community by releasing the kids. So Vinny, are you seeing that happen? I mean, what's, what's your yeah. sense of what's happening? Are there big numbers of kids being released from around the country? Absolutely, the Casey Foundation, which is in 80 different sites, probably more than this, but I know that there's at least 80 different sites. They've surveyed 
detention systems around the country. And there's pretty substantial declines in the number of kids in detention. New York City has a 30% decline in both the number of kids in its detention facility and in its placement facilities. I was talking to folks in Milwaukee, was super impressed. The folks in Milwaukee are proposing a zero detention or zero youth incarceration position. They've actually proposed to create such a position modeled after a proposal in Seattle. So interestingly, I think, because as Hernan said, this incarceration wasn't such a great idea before the pandemic. It's not like, ooh, we're giving up on something really good here. That's, this is a bummer. No, there were a lot of unnecessary incarceration going on. Kids mm -hmm. were being harmed. They were getting made worse. So some places are saying, hey, let's not just use this to figure out what to do now. Let's use this to figure out what to do from now on. Let's not get back to normal. Yeah, I want to get a bunch of stuff back to normal. I want kids going back to school. I want to be able to go to bars and restaurants and movie theaters, all that stuff. I'd like to get my hair cut. I'm a little suspicious about her non's hair. It's a little too tight for me. I'm wondering, is, did he visit the barber? You know, I'm, I'm kind of worried about that. But, you know, I'd like to get back to normal, not in juvenile incarceration. In juvenile incarceration, we should use this as a watershed moment. So, Vinny, just to follow up on that, you you have co-founded the Youth Correctional Leaders for Justice. Can you just talk for a minute about that group and what they're doing and saying at this point in time? Yeah, and that, in many ways, it was inspired by some of the work you've done, Liz, and Hernan, and, 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 you know, Ritha. There are people all around the country, advocates, who are out there, as they should be, having a voice in what should happen to the future of youth incarceration. And too often, youth correctional leaders just kind of sit on the sidelines of those conversations. We deal with our own stuff, but we don't have a public voice about it. And many of us feel that there are too many kids being locked up, that these facilities are in lousy condition, and that, that you know, all the stuff we just said, that it's harmful to young people and to society to treat young people like prisoners. And so uh, Youth Correctional Leaders for Justice came out publicly and said, we should stop, not just we should have fewer kids locked up, we should have nobody in anything that looks like a youth prison. We should end the use of that very model and start putting kids back home. And for the few, few kids who do need to be out of home for whatever reason that is, their safety, our safety, whatever that is, that it be small and homelike and decent and someplace where their families can come see them very easily. Nothing that looks like a big prison for young people. And so then when, when the virus started hitting about a month ago, we got together, we started talking and saying, okay, what, what should people be doing right now? And, and that's where I said, we came out with a series of recommendations, 32 of us signed on, all current or former youth correctional administrators that said we need to get the kids out before the virus hits, uh, the ones that can be gotten out. And then we need to come up with COVID plans. We need to get kids off probation so they're not coming to waiting rooms and sitting around and infecting each other and infecting staff and getting violated for stupid stuff. And then we need to have resources put in to help their families so that when they come home, they're able to thrive. That's a, a rough summary. If you go to yclj.org, you'll see the whole statement and a, uh, a bit of a clearinghouse discussing what is happening in different places around the country. That's great, Vinny. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Ritha, I'd like to turn to you. What's happening in New Jersey on this and how are you, are, are you seeing some of the same things that Vinny just described happening elsewhere, happening in New Jersey? I think we may have, uh, we may have lost you for a second there, Ritha. Okay, we'll come back to you, Ritha, in a second. Um, so Hernan, so what, Vinny was saying in terms of correctional leaders organizing around this issue. Can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of young people who are directly impacted uh, and family members and other allies, what they're doing about this, what they're thinking about this, what they're saying about this? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, number one, you can imagine that any young person or family member who's currently engaged right now in this conversation um, around the country is not very happy and is very scared. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, the the impending fear of whether or not your child might, you know, actually test positive for COVID-19 while being incarcerated in a facility 
um, is, is raising the anxiety of family members around the country, right? And for the campaigns that we've been able to work with um, at Youth First, um, most of the conversations that we've had with organizers and others doing the work on the ground um, has pointed to the need for youth and families' and stories to be included in the larger narrative around getting people out. Um, and, and a lot of this is, is really making sure that as we're actively thinking about um, what the solutions are going to be for young people as they return to their communities if they're being released, is that we really need to talk to youth and families currently outside in the community and young people who've been formerly incarcerated to really talk about what are the different needs and things that we need to invest on as we're actively saying to get out, to get young people out as soon as possible and to divest from the youth prison model, right? And a lot of what we've seen in the states that we've worked with, but also some of our other partner states in uh, states around the country has been this overwhelming ask to halt admissions, get people out, reinvest in those community alternatives, and ultimately work with youth and families to develop transition plans for young people getting out, right? Nobody wants their young person to remain inside of a facility. No family member wants to see them sitting there. And some of the questions or some of the things that people um, have made argument around is, well, if a young person is in a facility right now and they come out, aren't they safer in a facility than outside? They're not returning to something stable. Maybe some of them don't even have a place to come back to. And I just want to remind people that there's a problem in that statement, right? That if a young person doesn't have a place to return to in the community, that if a young person says that they don't feel safe returning back to the community and that they feel that they need to be in prison to find safety or to have shelter, to have food, that is a problem, right? We shouldn't have young people actively saying that the need for a prison is because they don't have anything else in their lives, right? And so as we're actively hearing that from young people too who are currently inside and who we've had some level of, of being able to hear from, um, that, is, that really concerns me, right? That our young people feel that la lack of support and their lack of hope uh, that when they return to the community that they're not gonna have the supports that they need. And so as we're actively engaging youth and families and other organizers on the ground. We've been putting together letters um, to the governors and, and other elected officials who have decision-making power in the juvenile justice systems around the country to ensure that they hear very loud and clear from community that they need to get as many young people out. Not only that, but we've also been able to support young people and families in getting their voices out there through social media, through actively posting um, graphics that say free our youth and literally young people and family members have taken a paper, wrote in the word free our youth, you can see it right there in the corner of my screen and literally putting it out so that social media and the rest of the world can become aware of the crisis that we're in. Um, and I just wanna be clear, right? We're saying young people, we wanna get them out. That's around 43,000 young people that we're talking about out of the larger chunk of the criminal justice system, right? There is way more uh, people that we need to get out, but we're actively saying that young people should also be at a priority list to get out uh, because of, again, them being such a small population in the larger pie of the criminal justice system, which, again, shouldn't be a pie at all, right? Like the whole bakery should be shut down. Um, but ultimately, um, those are some of the things that we're seeing around the country around getting uh, young people and families involved with. Hernan, um, for jurisdictions that haven't yet taken action on this, right, they haven't released young people or they haven't halted admissions, um, what do you think they could be doing right now in this moment to move to move in the direction that you're suggesting? Um, and and when you are saying that, Liz, are we talking about state officials or are we talking about the community organizer? Maybe both, actually. Okay, for for community organizers, for the people who have not yet um, sort of organized around this issue, there are a variety of resources available, right, right to be able to get that started um, mm -hmm. at Youth First. Uh, we've been able to create a resource tab labeled COVID-19. So you go to nocribsinprison.org slash COVID-19, and you can see a bunch of template letters for governors. You'll see a bunch of toolkits for social media um, moves that you can make, um, as well as a, a draft uh, letter to uh, a draft um, template for what you could say once you call your elected official uh, who has some decision-making power on this. So for those organizers, there's a way to easily tap in and, and very quickly mobilize around this and get other people involved as soon as possible. And for the elected officials who hear this, well, you know, do you want to be on the wrong or right side of history when it comes to helping young people in the middle of this crisis? 
Um, and if you want to be on the right side of history, then you really need to take a look at what decision you are making currently around getting young, many young people out as soon as possible. Um, it isn't a question of whether or not this is, um, you know, a public safety issue anymore. This is a public health crisis. Um, this is an issue that, again, is going to impact our communities, whether we like it or not. Um, and it's impacting young people directly at an alarming rate around the country. And so for those elected officials, you know, that there have been some um, actions on behalf of some governors, uh, both in New York and California, right, to get some people out. Um, it hasn't been a huge chunk, um, but ultimately there are moves that are happening to get people out. And so there are some tangible um, things that we can look at um, in some states as opportunities for other governors and, and mayors and other elected officials to take a look at. You also have the uh, Youth Correctional Leaders for Justice group. They also li listed out a bunch of recommendations for some of the elected officials out there in case you need some policy wording for how you're gonna put that uh, memo out or, or getting the word out to the larger public through an order of some kind. So the resources are available. Uh, you can tap into no Kids in Prison Network, the Columbia Justice Lab, uh, which is Vinny's group as well. And there are a variety of other resources out there for the other populations that we're not able to fully talk about in this conversation as well. Thank you, Hernan. Um, so Vinny, for jurisdictions that haven't taken action on this, what, what would you be suggesting that they, they, they do? And then I know we have some questions from our audience and I wanna to get to them too. Yep, I would suggest they pick several categories of young person that cannot come into their facilities or must leave their facilities. I would suggest a few like kids accused of misdemeanors, kids accused of technical violations or program failures or anybody that's close to the end of their time. Get them out as quickly as you can so that there's room immediately. And then set up a process and a committee to evaluate all the remaining kids, really literally every kid in your facility. Most facilities now are, they're smaller than small middle schools. So you shouldn't think of them as 10,000 you know, person places, they're 200 person places are big ones. I don't like them that big, but even that is a manageable number for you to look through every single kid and say, who's got asthma, who's got diabetes, who's got any diseases that would put them at risk to heighten their reasoning for getting them out. And then just individually start looking at every other kid in the place as to whether you can make a plan for them that makes you feel like you've achieved public safety and also achieved public health. We should not be pitting public safety and public health against each other. If cutting the youth prison population by 59% over the last 20 years has taught us anything, it's that we can reduce the number of kids we lock up safely as long as we plan it out. Well, thank you, Vinny. That's great. Um, and I just want to give Retha a chance to jump back in here. We may have lost her on the on the screen here. Um, okay. All right. So, Sean, I'm going to turn it back to you for some questions uh, from our audience. Uh, actually, I would like to start with a question. I'm not sure to whom I'm addressing this, but I'm curious what anyone on the panel would say to critics who say there's a danger. Uh, in letting out people who are incarcerated. It's a question that I've been asking throughout the Searchlight series because there are people in our audience who, who are gonna have that thought. And I'm curious what you would say in response to it. I guess I'll, Vinny, do you mind taking a swing at that? Well, what would you say to someone who said that, uh, I actually quoted someone two weeks ago um, uh, a victim's advocate who said that, you know, there are, are competing public health questions here and there's a, a danger to letting people out um, of prison and that you have to balance on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, I think that the uh, emperor really has no clothes on when it comes to uh, public safety and lockup. I think that we're learning it more and more and the, the juvenile system is leading the way on that. So many places, I mean, California used to have 10,000 kids in its Department of Juvenile Justice, and now it's got 700 kids. New York City used to send 2,000 kids to state youth prisons. There's 70, in, and nobody's in state youth prisons now. The 70 are all in local small facilities in New York City. And California and New York City's juvenile crime rates have plummeted during that time period. Partly that's because 
uh, locking those kids up was unnecessary. And partly it's because they've been able to capture much of the money that was going to those facilities and put them back into communities. So if you just dump the kids on communities, you probably will have a bit of an uptick in crime. But if you, if you plan it out carefully, and especially if you're able to capture some of the savings, uh, then, then I, 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 I think honestly, you're gonna do better in terms of not just your humanity and your decency, but your public safety. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, I'm gonna invite my colleague, um, Jamie Martirana to join us. She's with our marketing team and she's running the technology back behind this. And she's gonna magically appear here. <laughs> Hello, Jamie. Hi, everyone. Jamie's following along on social media and has some questions from our audience. Mm -hmm. So thank you again, uh, everyone for joining us this evening. We have about a hundred people on Facebook Live that are watching uh, the live stream right now. Um, and we have a number of questions that they have um, for the panel. So firstly, I'd like to ask, um, what are the expectations on finding a home for incarcerated juveniles that have nowhere else to go? So that may be released due to the global pandemic, but um, may not have resources outside of the facility. No, you wanna go for this one? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I did mention that um, in my remarks and I think part of what we're struggling with and, and what is a very clear reality, right? Like homelessness and issues with housing has been an issue before even criminal justice League was a whole thing um, in this country, right? We've always had that issue. I think one of the things that is really important to acknowledge about this is that, you know, Risa mentioned how much it costs to incarcerate a young person in New Jersey right now, right? A fraction of that money could easily be used to fund a transitional home somewhere in the community where this young person is from. There is money that we can easily um, shift to be able to uh, revamp and or utilize a space in the community that might now might not be used in any way and ultimately flip that and turn that into a space for young people to be uh, transitioning to as this pandemic uh, arises, but also for the long haul, right? So that young people have a safe place to be at. Um, as Vinny said, we do have young people right now who ultimately at some point or other might require um, uh, some type of support that has them away from their home at this time. Uh, we're not saying, you know, go and build another mini prison somewhere with like smaller barbed wire fences and less security features and just make it more state of the art. Uh, what we're saying is, you know, make sure that young people have a place to go to that they feel comfortable, but also that maybe they play a role in designing and or thinking through, right? So there might be conversations that we could be having right now with young people who are both incarcerated, but also those in community to talk through what an ideal space would look like for them. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we don't have those conversations happening because we're too focused on keeping them locked up. And so for anyone who uh, wishes to, you know, explore those ideas, um, I think we have plenty of young people both locked up and outside who are free, uh, who experienced incarceration at one point who could easily help us think through what those creative supportive and otherwise uh, more helpful solutions might be um, given that they might not want to go directly home, but they might need another step down process to begin with. Hernan, can you add a little bit to that in terms of the visioning sessions that you've been doing with young people around the country, just to kind of lift up that piece a little bit? Sure, so one of the things that we've done at Youth First is, and we say this very bluntly and clear, right? We don't want to create campaigns that are just solely um, being guided by and or whose vision is just from one person or one group of individuals, right, but that it is fed by the community itself. Visioning sessions are, are one method in which we have employed um, in different states and, and training young people and uh, families to be able to go out to communities and essentially have conversations, very candid conversations around what reinvestment dollars should go into. Um, we've been able to do all these sessions, uh, a, a variety of these kinds of sessions in a constellation of different settings uh, with a variety of different groups and young people alike. Um, and ultimately, much of the conversation around um, reinvestment whenever we have these visioning sessions revolves around if you had X amount of dollars, which it might cost, like say for example, I'm gonna use New York. Right now it costs around $450,000 to house one young person for one year in New York State. That's almost half a million dollars. And so what we would pose as a question to young people and families is, if I gave you $450,000 right now in this moment, what would, you do, what would you do with that money, right? What would you use it for? And some of the things that we've hear, heard from young people and families is, you know, I'd buy multiple homes, I'd buy a car, 
uh, young people will go as far as saying, you know, I'll use it for something, you know, like a, a, a theme park or something that's more creative and fun for them. And then when you talk about the total cost of incarceration um, in New York State, um, and you start hitting the millions of dollars, right? So if you start thinking about $450,000 and maybe you have 70 young people at Brookwood Secure Center, for example, right, which is about the number of young people that are currently there, that's around $31 million that right now is being used to support whatever is happening in facilities. And most of that money is going to salaries for people, for people's pensions, for people's, you know, salaries. And ultimately, you know, what we're asking young people aside on that, on, on top of the $450 is if you have $31 million, what would you do with that money? And the solutions that they come up with do not talk about more programming and facilities, do not talk about building more facilities, more prisons. They're not talking about building more alternatives to incarceration. Some of them are saying building jobs, building companies, moving their social economic status in a completely different direction, owning property, owning real estate. And so when we talk about what will really fix the problems that we're talking about in juvenile justice and in the broader criminal justice conversation, as this points out, our visioning sessions that we've been able to lead and also the visioning sessions that we've been able to witness with some of our partner states um, has led for us to us concluding that the real solution is in community and it's not in a prison setting and that these visioning sessions constantly highlight that. Um, and we also have uh, a bunch of those up on the nokidsinprison.org website. So if you wanna check them out, uh, we have them there and we have a list uh, of, of a number of them from different states, but we also have one big one, which is one that is um, in partnership with Cities United, um, which is another organization doing work out here. Um, and ultimately, again, it's, a, it's one place where we can look at for solutions that might otherwise not be presented in this presentation. Anything else to add, anyone? I would say that some of that money is literal that, that Hernan is talking about. I mean, it's very literal. Like, so I'm working with, Minnesota, uh, with Milwaukee right now. And literally, when they send a kid from Milwaukee County to their really terrible state juvenile facilities, they send $200,000 with that kid. It costs $400,000. They're only, they're only paying for half. But they have to pay the state $200,000. So there can be no excuse for not having a place for that kid to go. You could buy a house in Milwaukee for $200,000, um, not even having to rent it. Uh, so when we, when we did New York's Close to Home Initiative, we took all the kids back from state custody. Nobody's in state custody from juvenile uh, court anymore, from family court. And with them came $41 million. So we're, we're talking big numbers here uh, and uh, we, we really shouldn't get ourselves into a scarcity mentality when it comes to anything, whether that's housing or anything else, to be honest with you. Well, here in Pennsylvania, we had the kids for cash scandal. Is there a profit motive to keep the system as it is? I ask that expecting to know the answer, but I'll go ahead and toss it out to someone on the panel as well. I mean, I, I'll just say, you know, incarceration is big business. And so people make a lot of money off of it, right? The, the food service that you have inside the correctional facilities, in some places, these facilities are the largest employer in that town, right? So they employ a lot of people and they um, also employ a lot of contractors that work inside the facility and provide a bunch of services. And so when you're talking about decarcerating, that's one thing. When you're talking about getting rid of a facility, you are going after uh, people's jobs and uh, the economic system in some towns. And so what we have to do as a community is really look at, aren't there better ways that people can um, have a, a stable economy and you know jobs that nurture the human potential rather than jobs that cage people? And so sometimes our community and the youth justice movement is pitted against the labor community, which we really are in the same community and we're fighting each other in terms of closing these facilities because of the economic situation. And that's something we need to really work through. Hmm. Jamie, do I have any other, maybe one last question from Facebook or from social media somewhere? Um, sure. Um, so do you find that the general public tends to be more or less sympathetic to folks who are advocating for incarcerated youth versus the general population? Um, or are the responses from people that you 
um, engage with in the public generally the same. Vinny, do you want to take that? I'm not 100% sure what the question means. Are you juxtaposing uh, advocating for kids versus advocating for adults? Is that what the question is trying to get at? Yes, that's my understanding. Yeah. So I think there's a combination of things going on there. I think one of them is, yes, I think that there's a bit more sympathy for juveniles. Although I don't think we should lean too heavily on that. In the mid nineties, when this was at its peak, 60% of respondents to a, a California poll thought that kids were committing, committing most crimes when kids were committing 13% of crimes at that time. So, um, you know, at its peak, People were really uh, bought into the super predator notion and kids were public enemy number one. Uh, it moved from that due to a bunch of reasons. Part of it was staunch advocacy. I want to go back to that and never forgetting families and young people themselves as part of that advocacy. And I don't think that, and I was on both sides of this because I was doing adult work as well. I think for a long, it took a longer time for people who are advocating for criminal justice reforms to make room mm -hmm. for formerly incarcerated people in that conversation. We've seen that as that's occurred, I think then we've started to move the dial on criminal justice the way we have on juvenile justice. So that's one thing. The other thing is uh, the, the juvenile justice system was always a bit more used to paying for stuff so that when kids did come back, uh, money flowed uh, to communities not always to communities per se, sometimes it's to big nonprofit organizations, but at least it, there was always the notion that juvenile justice agencies bought stuff for their kids, bought aftercare, bought group mm -hmm. homes, bought multi-systemic therapy, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. That really kind of disappeared in the adult criminal justice system in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Rehabilitation was truly dead in those systems other than individual uh, efforts, but systemically people had moved away mm -hmm. from rehabilitation. So it might've been a bit of a shorter walk for the juvenile system to, to move money into the communities than it has been uh, for the adult system. It's gonna be a bigger fight to wrench that money away from prisons to truly fund community supports for people coming home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Sean, yeah, I was going to say before we wrap up, I want to, I'd love to hear from Vinny and Hernan on what they would recommend your viewers uh, do to get involved in the youth justice movement if they are interested. Um, so oh. Hernan, do you want to, do you want to share what you think on that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, I've been cheating y'all, you know, I've been keeping track of who's been saying what on on my phone, but ultimately, I know that the link for nokidsinprison.org has been shared, and so there are a bunch of resources there uh, that I think all of you who are interested in uh, engaging in uh, some type of action should definitely check out. And that again is that um, slash nokidsinprison.org slash um, COVID-19. And I think there's another movement happening uh, currently, which is the Free Our Youth hashtag, um, and it is an organized effort. Um, across uh, 40 plus states to really um, get the attention of governors and other elected officials to act now on this issue. Um, and so ultimately, if you want to get involved, the, you can do the most simple thing of taking a picture with that hashtag, uh, putting the ad symbol for the governor in your particular state, uh, putting that picture on Facebook, Instagram, uh, and Twitter, use the hashtag, tag the governor, and, and demand that they release as young people that are currently in their facility in your state. Um, and ultimately, uh, what we're trying to do is build a collective effort, a collective voice. Um, and as we continue to build momentum, that is ways that people could get involved. There's been other actions that have happened in other states. In LA, for example, shout out to Youth Justice Coalition who organized a powerful car march um, and really, again, uh, went and, and vocalized uh, to many of the elected officials out there the need to get our people out of California youth prisons and ultimately of the detention out there as well. And so there are little actions that we can 
organize and activate our bases around. Um, and if we really want to do that, now is the time. Um, and, and again, just tune into other conversations happening. This is not the only conversation that will be taking place. On Thursday, we have an action happening here in New York uh, to demand the release of young people from Horizons and Crossroads Juvenile Detention Centers, where a lot has happened in the last couple of uh, days uh, even. So uh, just stay tuned um, and stay connected and, and ultimately reach out to myself, uh, Liz, or anyone on this panel if you want to get more involved. Thanks, Hernan. Um, Vinny, do you have recommendations? I don't have a lot to add to what Hernan said. I think that was really terrific. The only uh, the only thing I would add is, and when it's over, whatever over means, because I don't think we even know what over means just yet, we don't want to go back to where it was. So those are the actions that Hernan just said, please do not let society forget about these young people. They're easily forgotten for some people in power. And what Hernan recommended was exactly right, I think. Uh, but once once we're out of this, uh, we don't want to go back to normal and we'll, we'll need to come up with the next stage of actions uh, to keep these places from filling back up again, because nature and government bureaucracies abhor a vacuum. Thank you, Vinny. So back to you, Sean. Uh, I want to thank our panel. You've been really generous with your time. Thank you all so much for being here. We admire your work. We wish you the best of luck and Godspeed. Uh, and the important work that you're doing in advocating for young people um, in the United States in this terrible, terrible moment. So uh, thanks especially to you, um, Liz, for organizing the panel, uh, but also Hernan Carvente Martinez and Vincent Chiraldi and uh, Aretha Onatiri. I, I hope that you're okay. <laughs> we lost Aretha along the way somewhere. Um, but um, thank you all for tuning in. Thanks, Jamie, for your help on the tech end of things. Um, and uh, if you want to follow along with uh, Eastern States other programming, uh, we're on all the forms of social media that you would expect. Thank you all so much from Eastern State Penitentiary. Hope to see you next Tuesday night for the Searchlight series. Good night. <laughs>